it seems like you know every venture that he did, whether it be Mad or um, Trump or Humboldt or Help or the Lane Fan or whatever jungle book, these were not appreciated in their time in the same way. And he was always each venture was sort of failing after three issues or you know twenty four issues, and um, you know never had the success. And I wonder around the house now, like you know, did you hear anything about that? Like you know, it's like you know. You know you start with all this promise, this genius, and inevitably, because the world hasn't brought up to you, you have to compromise your vision. Did he ever, was he, you know? I don't know that he talked to me about compromising his vision, I will say, but what was most notable to me, you know, we didn't talk, those magazines were things I sort of heard of that were like ghosts in the house for me, somewhat. But I know that, and I always felt, I realized this in reading the book, and, and thinking about it a lot today, that as a kid, I had some delusion that I was kind of his collaborator, and I don't know where I got that from, but I, obviously it's because he was the kind of parent that made me feel that way, which speaks very well to him, I think. But I was always kind of like, when do we get this film project off the ground? And I think that, you know, and I've talked about this before, I think, at least from what I got from Osmosis and talking to him, he wanted to be a filmmaker and at some point. Like, he loved what he was doing, but I think that was always, like, right there. And he wasn't making it to that somehow. And Terry Gilliam, at his memorial service, spoke about how he thought, ultimately, he was drawn to the film business. And he kept telling me to be a filmmaker. You know, he dragged out a Super 8 camera and paid for me to make all these little movies. And, was always talking about movies, and, and I think that's where I got that desire from. And it was a bit of a, he wanted to do it, but since he wasn't going to do it, maybe you'll do it. And, and that's the disappointment that I could feel in a palpable way growing up, more than I did about failed magazines or comic books. And you see the film quality in his work, too, because he did his art was almost storyboard, as if you were the film, and then, you know, very subtle differences from panel to panel. Um, you see it in work like Bruce Pfeiffer would do in the village voice, but it was his subtle gestures would change, but Harvey did it first, and Harvey did it, I think, really expertly. But you also see it when he was doing Help Magazine with the Fumetis, where he would take photos and put funny captions on it, which you'd see with, you know, Fari Ackman did famous monsters of him. So I found that interesting. In San Diego, we talked about the film, filming of Paul, and I hadn't really thought about that in his work, but you actually do see it. Yeah. And you know what's interesting, you know, when you talk about the Fumetti stuff and a lot of the humor in Mad, you know, when I looked at it, the, when, as I started to become an adult, I was like, I've seen a lot of this. And it's hard to wrap my head around the fact that, yeah, but he did it first. Like, you know, especially being related to him, it's like, oh, this is stuff everyone does, but I guess it's kind of nice that he did it first. But it's hard to believe. And did he have stuff around the house? Did he have things hanging up? Was he proud of his art? Yeah, I'd say he was definitely, I mean, his stuff was and is all around the house I was born in and my apartment. I mean, the stuff was around, but not in a bragging way, because we also had works from all his cartoonist friends up as well. So it was a big mix. And so as you're, as you're growing up, you're having, it's, it's, you know, it's an unfair question, but you kind of live with this shadow, which is, you know, something that most of us don't have, having a famous father. You know, what is that, you know, as you go through your career making your films, and then things you hear his voice, you hear uh, an influence, you see, I know, I, I shut off the lights in my apartment, and, 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 you know, it's like I'm, I'm working for Tanya, so I feel like my father come at me. Do you feel that in your work? Do you feel that in your work? Well, I think more than the work I do, it's the places I work that freak me out in terms of legacy, because, you know, in the book, there's a page all about when he worked at Marvel, and then he left, and, Disney just bought Marvel, and then I went to Simon & Schuster, and Simon & Schuster rejected him, and I'm waiting for a Disney story to pop out, although he took me to Disney, and we got to go into the underground studios at one point, because he knew someone there, so it's like the ghost of publishing comes back to me, and the voice saying, get out of publishing and do something more exciting, is the basic shadow behind me. Might be a little late. <laughs> 